I want to apologize if I'm all over the place this morning. I've rewritten this sermon at least four times in my head. Let's just get right into it. Before we get started, you know, the world is in the midst of a pandemic. And yet, we choose to defy all wise counsel of our political and religious leadership and have church service today. So let's talk about this pandemic for a little bit. It was an epidemic, now it's a pandemic. I, like you, probably had no idea what the difference was. So I looked it up. A pandemic just means that the virus has now gone worldwide. Pandemic is a Greek word. The word pan means all and demos means people. And so basically this virus is being spread to all people throughout the world. As opposed to an epidemic which would just be regional or local. And so the only difference between an epidemic and a pandemic is the mass spread of this virus. What we're faced with is a virus that is spreading worldwide. And as I watched the news and followed the decisions being made, I became very critical and considered there'd be many politicians and media that were exploiting the situation. If you follow me on Facebook, you probably even noticed earlier in the week, you know, I, I put some critical posts out there making fun of the toilet paper bandits and such. Since then, I've gone back and I've deleted all those. Uh, one post I put out there was, the Lord did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. That one I kept out there. But any post or any opinions that I put out there that were critical of others, God convicted me to remove those. Then I started seeing churches and church events being canceled one after another. And it gave me this pause to reconsider my stance on this. Especially as many started to begin to ask me, what would we do? And what would our response be? And so I prayed. And then I prayed. And then I prayed some more. And this is the conclusion that I've come to. For me, it's actually a pretty exciting conclusion. God has called me to a position of leadership within his church. A position that I very hesitantly have accepted up to this point. Not to compare myself to Moses, but I, I, like Moses, on many occasions look in the mirror and do not see myself fit to be standing before you preaching the word of God to you. But I've been told over and over that whom God calls, God will equip. And I do believe that God has called me to preach and proclaim his word. And I also believe, and I've come to the conclusion, that everything that I've done in my life up to this point has been ordained by God and has prepared me for the work he has called me to do. You see, since... Becoming a pastor, I felt like I needed to be less of me so that there could be more of God. I felt like God was calling me to to taper back my my personality and my individuality and and to seek things like meekness and humility. To be more like him and less like me. To not make it about me, but to make it about God and to make it about you. And all of that is true, and I believe that is a path that I must stay on. But as I have been seeking on how to handle the current events that are unfolding before our eyes, I believe that it is time for me to step out in absolute faith and boldness and to lead as God has appointed me to lead. For God has not given me a spirit of fear, but one of power and of love and of sound mind. And as I look around me, what I see most is a church and a world that is looking for peace that surpasses all understanding. People are looking for leadership. And instead, all they're seeing is panic, fear, and confusion. Now listen to me for a moment. There is a potentially deadly virus at hand, and we would be foolish to simply ignore it. In the military, we use terms commonly like stay alert, stay alive, keep your head on a swivel, maintain situational awareness. These are terms used by men 
who go out into the most hazardous of areas and do the most riskiest of missions. They realize that they can live on the edge, maintain a, a level of vigilance and alertness to minimize the risk at hand, but without compromising the mission that they're called to do. There's not much difference between the, the military and the church at hand. And with our current situation, we should take some precautions. We would be foolish not to. Yes, wash your hands. Probably more so than you're used to. Take some time to clean and disinfect commonly used items. Things like your cell phone, your doorknobs, and, and even your Bible. I gave this thing a good scrubbing yesterday. Along with my cell phone and my, my iPad and my, my phone. And, and believe it or not, we went through and we scrubbed this church down real good. We, we scrubbed down the door handles. Most of you probably noticed when you walked in this morning that someone opened the door for you. So you didn't even have to touch the door handles. We should be vigilant. We should stay alert. We should have situational awareness of what is happening around us. We should avoid and minimize unnecessary contact. We should cover our mouths when we cough, preferably with your sleeve and not your hand. All common things, simple things. But what we shouldn't do is we shouldn't lose perspective on the truth. And the truth is found here in the word of God. God is in control. He and he alone ordains the time and the circumstances of your death. And he is a God of mercy and a God of peace. I'm not telling you that by sitting here this morning, you're not going to get some deadly virus. But you know what? You may not even make it home without having a car accident today. God is in control. And so as we look at the world around us, for me, I was getting frustrated at the fear I was seeing and, and the confusion and, and, and what I considered to be mere silliness. But as we look at the world around us, we should understand something. The world should be afraid. The world should be very afraid. Because without Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, when people of this world die, they'll be faced with judgment. And they'll be faced with condemnation. And they'll be faced with hell. And hell is a very real and a very scary place. Believers in Jesus Christ have hope. Hope in an eternal future. But a lost sinful world has no such hope. They think they can control the things of this world. They think if they work hard enough and try hard enough and go to school and do all these good things that, that somehow it will all work out in the end. And then right before the very eyes, things start falling apart. And they don't have answers. And they're confused. And the things that they put their hope and their trust in just simply aren't there. The government can't save them. Doctors can't save them from hell. They cannot even save themselves. The world sees really quick that they're all hopeless and lost. And although they may not be contemplating the things of hell... What they're contemplating is what is right before them. An absolute sense of no control. Hopefully we as believers in Jesus Christ, we knew all along we're not in control. But we know who is in control. And we draw peace and strength from that. I apologize if I pause today because I'm going to go off script so much. I'm going to lose myself in my notes. We should not be amazed at the fear and the panic of the world around us. We sure, certainly shouldn't mock them and make fun of them. We should see it as an opportunity to witness to them. And so this is an opportunity for all of us to witness and to show the light and the love of Jesus. To simply be the church. Not to give in to fear, but to express our confidence in the one we follow. In the one that we call Lord Lord. And the one that is our Savior. The truth of the matter is, is there will always be something for us to fear. There will always be something for the world to fear. There will always be a, another epidemic, another pandemic. There will always be some wicked dictator or some communist regime. There will always be evil in this world. Every generation that I know of, 
From my grandfather to great-grandfather had an enemy, a foe to face. Whether it was the, the Nazis or the communist Russia or now uh, radical terrorists. There will always be a threat in this world. There will always be evil in this world. And God tells us over and over and over again, fear not. If we accomplish anything this week, we have shown the media exactly how much control they have over the minds of men. And I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, but trust me, they see the power they have and they will yield that power over and over and over again. The media can simply declare the next item on the shelf, the one to go. And everyone out of fear of not being able to get it will go and purchase it. You know, when I was growing up, it was done really more for fun. You know, most of y'all probably don't know what a Cabbage Patch doll is. Some of y'all might know what Tickle Me Elmo is. Almost every Christmas, the media will declare, this is the toy that your kid has to have. And parents will beat their head against the wall trying to find it because the stores will all be sold out. And so today, it's a little bit more insidious when they say, oh no, we're running out of toilet paper. More seriously, hand sanitizer. We have shown the media the power that they yield over us. So that's my intro. But we're going to look at the Word of God this morning. We're going to continue right along. I consider doing a separate, a different message, but God convicted. We're going to stay on course. We're going to look at God's Word this morning as we continue our study in the Gospel according to Luke. We're in Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Uh, a smaller chunk of verses this week. So I would ask that you stand with me. As we read these verses in Luke 9, starting in verse 28. About eight days later, Jesus took Peter, John, and James up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared and began talking with Jesus. They were glorious to see. And they were speaking about his exodus from this world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. Peter and the others had fallen asleep. And when they woke up, they saw Jesus' glory and the two men standing with him. As Moses and Elijah were starting to leave, Peter, not even knowing what he was saying, blurted out, Master, it is wonderful for us to be here. Let us make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he was saying these words, a cloud overshadowed them and terror gripped them as the cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. When the voice had finished, Jesus was there alone. And they didn't tell anyone at that time what they had seen. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we love you and we praise you, Father God. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to gather in your house to praise and to worship and to seek your face, Father God. Lord, I pray that your mercy would shine upon us this morning, Lord. That you would bless our hearts with your Holy Spirit presence. That you would speak to our minds, that you would convict us, that you would grow us, that you would simply love us this morning, Father God. Lord, we love you, and we give you all the praise and all the worship in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. And so the first thing we're told here is that Jesus was praying, and that his appearance was, was transformed. And, and again, I, I've rewritten this sermon over and over and over. And, and just simply this morning, God showed me something that is kind of mere speculation. Something I, I haven't heard anybody else talk about. Nothing I've read in my studies. But it, call it an epiphany. And it's really, in essence, my opinion of this. Which I really try to go off script. But the one thing I hadn't taken 
and it'll count was Jesus went up on the mountain to pray. And it says that Moses and Elijah were talking to him about his exodus, his descent. In other words, his, his death. And then we were told that, that the glory of Jesus is, is seen. We get a glimpse of his glory. I always, up to this point, and really in today's sermon, always seen this as, as us being able to get a glimpse into who Jesus was. But hopefully as, as Bible-believing, New Testament-believing, we already believe who Jesus is. And if nothing, it would just reinforce. And, and this morning, I, I saw something different. We realized that Jesus did not want to go to the cross willingly. In, in the Garden of Gethsemane, we know that he prayed, Father, if you can, take this cup from me. The cross is not to be taken lightly. The cross was, was brutal and it was painful. And any man rightfully would, would be hesitant to do such a thing. And we know that in that garden, Jesus prayed and that, that God strengthened him. And he was able to stand up and he was able to deliver himself into the evil hands of, of men who were there to arrest him. And to put him on trial and to ultimately crucify him. And the one thing I see here is, is maybe this episode is an example for us, but not an example of us to look and see the glory of God, but an example for us to look and see the humanity of Jesus Christ. It said he went up onto the mountain. He went up on the mountain to pray. He was about to head towards Jerusalem, which was is, which is to head towards his crucifixion. And, and I'm thinking this morning, maybe Jesus was praying again in the garden. Father God, if there's any way this cup can come before me. Jesus had this burden of the crucifixion. And maybe God sent Moses and Elijah to encourage him. It says that they were there to talk about his de decrease, his exodus, his death. Now, Moses and Elijah are not equals to Jesus. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is, is God in the flesh. There's no equality here. But these are men, it says it was glorious to see them. These are men who I assume are in the, in the presence of God. They're, they're, they're somewhere eternal. And they come down and I believe, I'm speculating, but I believe maybe they came down to encourage Jesus. And in that encouragement, I believe it worked. And the reason I believe it worked is what happened. Jesus' face began to shine and his, his clothes began to glow. I, I, maybe they went down there and they gave Jesus a motivational pep talk. And in that pep talk, they reminded him of, of who he was. And it reminded him of the glory of God. And that glory just started to shine amongst him. I, again, I'm speculating and, and I don't want to do that too much. But, but that's what I see here. The glory of God is being revealed. And so I, I'm speculating this morning that maybe they came down to encourage Jesus as a result of his prayer to God, to encourage him to keep on the path, to do what needs to be done, to be strong and to be bold and be courageous. And as God tells us over and over and over again, to fear not. Now I'll go back to my notes. First thing we're told is that Jesus was praying and his appearance was transformed. Both his face and his clothes. The, the image is there. We know that when Moses himself went up onto the mountain of God and spent 40 days with God on the mountain. And when he came back down, it said that he was in such a, a glorious state from being in the presence of God that his face shone. And his face shone so bright with the glory of God that the people... The nation of Israel asked him to wear a veil because they could not even stand to look upon his face. We know that in Moses' case, that that glow eventually went away and eventually faded. But for a short time, the glow, the glory of God shone upon his face. We know that as Jesus was up on this mountain, that it was not his full glory, that it was not that time yet, that it was just a glimpse of it. It says that Moses and Elijah, that they were glorious to see. That, that tells me that, again, that they've come from some place, some place where most likely in the presence of God, like Moses was on the mountain. Wherever they came from, the glory of God was, was shining upon them. Peter here, he is a little confused. He still doesn't fully comprehend who Jesus is or why he has come. Peter, this time, does not know of Jesus' pending death, even though Jesus has told him already. Peter doesn't have the full picture 
of the pending death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that we have. We have it here. We know more than Peter knew at this time. We know the beginning and we know the end. And we know the one that saves us. We understand that Jesus is more than just another prophet. That Jesus is the one true God in the person of the Son of God. We believe that Jesus was crucified for the sins of the world. And that he was buried and three days later he raised again. That he ministered on this earth for another 40 days. And then he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of God the Father. And to be seated at the right hand of God means that Jesus has been given all authority over heaven and earth. Yes, Jesus is in charge this very day. He's not just sitting there. He is at work. And his primary tool for doing work on this earth is his church. The church that he himself is the head of. We are the tools of Jesus for sharing the good news of his saving grace. That is why we have been gifted with the presence of his Holy Spirit in us. Listen to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. It's easy for us to focus on what we call the great commandment here and miss two other great points in this text. First is that Jesus tells us up front, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus tells us that he is, in fact, in charge. And the second one, he tells us, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You know, some people have this image of, of Christ sitting in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God, as if he's just sitting back, sipping a, a cool iced tea, waiting for us to come to him. As if he is an active, working God. Jesus is the Lord of earth and heaven. Sitting at the right hand of God. There's, there's a symbol there. That's where we get the term that someone is, is your right hand man. To sit at the left hand of God is to be cursed and condemned. To sit at the right hand of God is to be put in charge, the place of authority. Joseph, it says, he was, he was made the number two. He was put in charge of all of the affairs in Egypt. And it was said that when Joseph spoke, it was as, as if Pharaoh himself spoke. Jesus has been given all authority and all power. Jesus is in control. And he tells us, I am with you even to the end of the age. In the book of Acts chapter 2, there's a great sermon given by the apostle Peter. Listen to how he ends his sermon. Acts 2, verses 36 and 38. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said to them, repent. Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so Peter was given a glimpse of the Jesus that was to come. An ascended and glorified son who was Lord of all. The Jesus that would come fully. That he would come to fully understand and preach about. See, Peter on his hilltop, he doesn't see the full picture. But after Jesus is gone, when he's given this sermon, Jesus has already ascended into heaven. This is the day of Pentecost. This is the day that, that Peter received the Holy Spirit of God. It was a visible tongue of fire that fell upon him. And, Jesus, and Peter got up and Peter preached. And what did he preach? He preached that God made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. 
Peter would come later on to understand exactly who Jesus was. Peter would preach about Jesus. And one day, he would actually be crucified for his efforts. Alongside of his wife, just as many of the early church and the apostles were, they were martyred for proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ, for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the enemy, because Satan wanted to shut that message up, just as he wants to shut that message up today. I am not condemning or talking bad about any church that closed today. I believe that God led churches to do what churches do. And there are many churches that are far greater in numbers than us. And it may have been a very wise decision for them to do. But what we do here this morning should not be taken lightly. We're here to worship God. We're here to fill up on His Spirit and His Word. And then we're here to take that out and share it with the world around us. Today, I want to, and I'm going to hopefully motivate you to to see the crisis before us and know how to use it for the glory of God. Satan wants us to sit down and shut up. There's many people that, many secular people, people outside of the church who just said, we just need to close the doors and not, not gather this morning. My son, some of y'all may know, he's a young man. He's newly married. He was married in May. For the last three or four months, he's been training in Fort Lee, Virginia, while his new wife is living in Memphis. This weekend is her birthday. And so for quite some time, he decided he was going to surprise her and fly home for her birthday. And then this happened. Friday afternoon... My son was on an airplane flying to Memphis to see his bride. Virus wasn't going to slow him down. I thought about it for a second. Ooh, you're getting on an airplane? People are flying all over this country. The massive cities in our nation, people are on subways and trains and buses. They don't even own cars. And yet they tell us, well, don't bother meeting for church. There was nothing that was going to stop my son from going to see his bride this weekend. But I'll tell you, what we're doing here is more important than what he's doing. What we're doing here is more important than going to work. We're not going to downplay it. Part of my decision was, what about next week? What about the following week? What about a year from now when we are in a massive zombie epidemic? (laughs) Are we just going to quit meeting? I don't want to act like we have superpowers. I don't want to say that we're immune to this. Back in the 1800s when the Great Plague struck Europe, what, how did Christians respond? It? They went into the neighborhoods that were hit the hardest to minister both healthy and spiritually to those who were sick and dying. And in many cases, those very Christians went into plague-struck neighborhoods and they contracted the plague and they died in those very same neighborhoods ministering to people. They understood that the plague could kill the body. But without Jesus Christ, more was going to be at stake than their physical bodies. There was a witness. People saw how the church responded. I'm not telling you to foolishly go out and put yourself in harm's way. But I am telling you to be responsible and to put first things first. There are many children in this church that may one day feel the call to go into the mission field. May be called to go into a very hostile and violent country that does not accept Christian, Christianity or missionaries. And some parents would caution, would beg their children to not do such a thing. I mean, we as parents, we want our children to live happy, healthy, successful American lives. 
Get a college degree, get a good job, get married, have two and a half kids, buy a home, buy some cars, go on vacation with us every year. Don't ruin that by going to Liberia and witnessing to to TB-plagued villages. How are we ever going to get together? How am I going to see you? How am I going to see the grandchildren? We're called to live lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, And listen, sadly enough, we are distracted in America. I'm not telling you to pack your bags and go to another country. What we're going to see here is there is many opportunities that have come available to us as a church this very week right here in our very own community. All of the Bible is about the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible is the story of God's creation, of man's sin, and of Christ's redemption and condemnation. You see, we should not be surprised when the world around us gives in to fear and confusion because they are lost and they lack wisdom. And realistically, they should be afraid. They should be very afraid because for them, with death comes condemnation. When they die, they will rightly be punished and condemned to an eternity in hell. They will find there is no cosmic scale of justice, that karma truly is a female dog, and that salvation is always there for the taking. Try to be politically correct. The world will find out that their selfish desires and their foolish hearts fail to accept the truth. That is Jesus Christ. And so as believers, we must recognize that hell is for real. It is a prison created by God where unrighteous and wicked men and women will go. Where our sweet little grandmothers who have denied Christ will go. And that we are called to do the will of God the Father and of Jesus his Son. We are to proclaim salvation through Jesus Christ. And in times like these, times of fear and confusion, we're called to live out our faith and to proclaim the source of our strength and our peace. Scripture is clear. Things on earth are not going to get better. They're going to continue to digress. Whether it's from plagues, earthquakes, or famines, things will get worse. And our prayer should be, that it'll all be for the glory of God. Matthew 10, 28 tells us, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, if the harshness of times comes to help point people to salvation in Christ, then the death of the body becomes life in eternity. Listen, God is not a cruel or merciless God. Instead, he is a God of mercy and of compassion. It is his desire that none shall perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Our text this morning reads, Then the voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. When the voice finished, Jesus was there alone. What we do here is not a small thing. We come to worship the one true God. It is my prayer that we will go out this week with hearts full of grace, mercy, and compassion. That it comes straight from our great God. That we will understand that the fear and the foolishness that we are faced with, and we will use it as an opportunity to confront and love our neighbors with the love of Jesus. That we won't get caught up in taking sides. That we we won't be gripped with fear, but we also won't diminish the fears of others. But instead, we would walk right down the middle and look at how we can turn what the enemy meant for evil for good. If you really think about it, we have a great opportunity before us so many distractions have been removed from life and so many of our schedules have been blown wide open 
older students, whether you're a college student or a high school student. You can be a huge support this week. Your calendars are open. We've got many young children in your neighborhoods, in this church, in this community, who parents have no idea what they're going to do with them. Parents have to go to work. The children are out of school. What do we do with those? And I would say, look around you. Look for opportunities to watch those children. I was telling someone this morning, what a great opportunity. You look for someone who doesn't have someone to watch your children and may not even be able to afford to pay you. And you say, I'll watch your children for you. And then you get to spend the whole week with those children. You can do your very own mini VBS. You can give them a devotion each and every day. You can witness the love of gospel to them and to their children. You can pray with them. You can teach them out of God's word. Hopefully, not only do you show those children, those parents love, but hopefully the parents come home and the parents find that what they saw, thought was something disastrous, that they come home and they see that their children are calm and sane and polite little children who have been introduced to the gospel of Jesus. College students, high school students, you have the opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus this week. Look for the blessings that are before you. Don't look at what you've lost. I understand life is hard. Graduation, sporting events, different things have just been stripped away from you. But, but maybe God is stripping those things away so that we can see him more clearly. So that we can see the needs around us more clearly. Our food pantry is open. I put it in the bulletin. Food pantry is open for church members and non-church members. Maybe you know someone who has children, and those children normally get their, their meal, their lunch meal through school. So not only do they, they not have the school there, now they have to find daycare, but now, now they even have to find groceries for these kids. And oh, by the way, depending on what store you go to, there may not be a whole lot available. You come and, and you grab food in our food pantry, and you go knock on a neighbor's door, and you, and you give them food in the name of Jesus. And you tell them that we love them and we're here for them. Our food pantry is open. And yes, it's great when people come to us. But how much more blessed would it be when, when you come and you grab the food and you take it to them? Our food pantry is open. Almost all sporting events have been canceled. And again, it opens up great opportunities for families simply to spend time together. Three o'clock in the morning last night, I... Got some messages on, on Facebook Messenger from one of my closest and most dearest friends. He's currently stationed in Italy. And I checked up on him earlier in the week and he just finally got back to me. And, and he said, yes, things are chaotic over there. Just, just yesterday, 250 people died in the nation of Italy. Now, mind you, Europe is not America. All of Europe is about the size of, of Rhode Island. And so these countries aren't these mass countries that, that we think they are. They're, in fact, very small. Italy is not a, a large nation. 250 people died. Him and his family are basically quarantined to their home. But in that, he said, not to be, be coy, he said, but, but things aren't that bad. He said, we have a very large home. He has five children. We have a very large home and an even larger backyard. The government told him, go home, quarantine yourself. So he's forced to go home and spend extra time with his wife and his children. There are opportunities before us, opportunities to glorify God, opportunities to serve one another. Let's not miss these opportunities as we leave out this morning. Let's simply go out and be the church. The old saying, let's make lemonade out of lemons. More importantly, let's show people the joy and the peace that lives in us through the Holy Spirit of God. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Let's pray. Sweet Father God, Lord, we, we humbly come before you this morning, Lord, and we pray for your hand of mercy and your hand of healing, Father God. Lord, we do pray that this pandemic would, would end and it would end soon, Father. 
And Lord, we pray for any who are touched by this virus. But more importantly, we pray for those who do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We pray, Father God, that you would give them yet one more day. We pray, Father God, that you would put it on the hearts and the minds of believers to go and to share. Share the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, it is your desire that none shall perish. And I pray, Lord, that your desire is our desire. That we don't see what we have lost, but we see the opportunities that are before us, Father God. I pray that we would not be complacent in our call to share the good news of Jesus Christ. To not just share it, but go out and to make disciples, to make sure that that your word is, is understood and accepted and believed. We would go out and we would baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Father God, we love you and we praise you. And we thank you, Father God, for the opportunity to be here. We lift up our nation. We lift up our world in prayer this morning, Father God. For it is in the holy and precious name of Jesus we pray.